Thank you, deacons. And thank you, Darcy, for sharing that verse. In Psalms 139, uh, which talks about uh, David. He comes to a point where he's saying, God, search me through and through. And I'm just wondering if any of you have prayed that this morning or throughout the week. Lord, search me. Scan me from head to toe. And so when we go through this communion service, as Darcy alluded to, it has beautiful significance in the tradition. And you don't really connect tradition with Jesus. But there are two traditions that Jesus implemented in his time, or which that we focus on. First one is baptism. And the second one is communion. These are the things that he emphasized on. In the communion one, he says, and do this as often as you gather. And it's quite similar to the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is remember, but then we don't remember. But the communion is, do this as often as, as you gather. But we don't do that that often. But when we do, we seem to run away. We seem to, it becomes the least popular tradition that we do. But it's the one that Jesus says, do as often as you gather. I started to think about why we run away from communion. When we hear communion or foot washing, what happens in the mind that causes us to miss church for that week? Book things that week? And I think there's a thing, obviously if people are sick, that's fine. But I think there's something that goes in my, in my mind when I was a young person, I heard communion, I just thought about foot washing. But I think it's human nature, like we're, we're sinful in, in our human nature, that the thought of serving someone else somehow comes out in our actions and we tend to avoid serving other people. But when people are serving us, we're there. Does that make sense? So when Jesus here illustrates in John 13 this servanthood that the disciples didn't really understand that much because Jesus went down, knelt down, and started to wash his disciples' feet. And what did Peter say? Yeah, you're not going to wash my feet. And then what does Jesus reply? You have no part with me if I don't wash your feet. And so Jesus was illustrating the currency of heaven. The currency isn't in heaven isn't based on silver, but the currency in heaven is based on servanthood. The angels serve each other constantly. Servanthood. In another way, humility is the other thing. Something that us as humans, me as a person as well, struggle with, humility. Humility is this idea that we need to reset and empty ourselves. There's a point in the Passover, it was a seven-day uh, festival one of the greatest ones in the Jewish culture, Jewish tradition. Jesus was, it came to the Thursday, so it finished on Friday. Came to Thursday, usually they'll have a meal on Friday, but Jesus brought it back early. And they had it on Thursday. Because Jesus was preparing for the next day. The Passover had past significance they would remember the time where God had led them out of Egypt and how God had provided for them and during the plagues the last plague they put the blood of a male lamb over the posts and that meant that the angel of death would pass over and then they passed through and passed over to the other side So this was the festival 
that when the disciples were in the same room together, it was quite different to this. We have a table. It's a little different to how we do it. In Jesus' time, they were on the floor, and it was a, a U-shaped, and they sat down together. And this is where Jesus then conducts his foot washing service, and he washes their feet. So in their mind, they're thinking about this Passover on how God had led them. But what Jesus does, he adds new meaning to this tradition, and he blows it up and expands it, and he makes it, and he points it towards a future reference as well. So when we're looking at the foot washing part of it, it's actually an ancient tradition in the Jewish culture. And if you turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18, you'll see there in the first few verses, and also Genesis chapter 19, you'll see there in the first few verses as well. When you get there, can you say amen? There are two people that it focuses on. In Genesis 18, it talks about Abraham. How many guests came to visit him? Three. What did Abraham do when he saw the guests? He forgot he was old. And he ran and invited them in to the place. This is the Jewish culture. They invited these guests in and they served them. How did they serve them? Their feet, the guests, their feet were washed. They gave him a morsel of bread or a piece of bread. And they gave him drink. And the last one is they invited them to what? Stay the night. Now, we don't do that last one as often because in our society it's a bit weird. If we have a guest come in and say, he should stay the night. <laughs> Depends on how close you are with the person. But in the Jewish culture, remember that these were travelers. They traveled long distances. So it's quite similar to the island culture as well. Before cars were implemented, the pastors would go from house to house and walk house to house. And they would eat. They wouldn't stay. They would eat and have a big feast. And then they'll go to the next house, and then the, the, the house, the guest, would feed them as well. And then they'll go to house to house. We still do that today in the island culture, but we have cars. You put two and two together. So in the Jewish culture, this is what they did. There was a servanthood, um, I guess, fabricated in the culture of, of the Jewish history. You see in Lot's story as well, he followed similar principles. He saw travelers, washed their feet, and invited them to come in. And he wanted them to come in. He actually begged for them to come in. Now, when you look at this culture, you've got to ask the question, um, how do other people who aren't part of God's team, how do they treat guests? God's people treat guests very well. Now, it makes me realize and think about the guests that we have not only in our house, but in our church. How do you treat your guests? Because you have in Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 19, you have the, the city want to have their way. In other words, they wanted to self-serve rather than serving the guests. They wanted to have their way with the guests. It makes me realize that the other side is more about self-serving than the other side. So when we're looking at foot washing, it's all about this servanthood, humility. And when I look at humility, I see we're just like this fish tank. This is the best illustration I've got. If you've got another one, tell me, and I'll use it. We're like a fish tank, right? And we fill our fish tank, not with water, but with Coke, because that's the best we got. And... This fish tank is old, and it's got all that uh, was it moss and green stuff, algae, and, but it also has some nice things in it as well, like, you know, there's little castles where the fish can play around. 
But because it's filled up with coke, the fish are dead in there. And, and you've got these little moths and uh, things growing, but you can't see it very well. And you can't see it because it's filled up with coke. And so humility, in my mind, is a matter of letting go of the coke and seeing everything that the fish tank has within it. We are like that fish tank. We've got a lot of pride and stuff, but we try to self-justify our actions. And that's not humility. One psychologist says true humility, true humility will understand their weaknesses and their strengths, their ups and downs, goods and bads. And they will understand that that's who they are at the moment. And they will not justify themselves. That's true humility. Have you ever come to a point where you're talking to someone and you're trying to justify why you did something? I did this because of this. Or in the past, let's go a little bit deeper. In the past, I'm like this because I've experienced this. And that's self-justification. Humility will understand that and and is requiring for us to not self-justify to come to a point where we don't self-justify. Now, it takes courage to do that because it's not an easy thing. So many times we try to justify ourselves, justify our actions. I do it all the time, talking to Serena. Oh, I did this. Why did you do that? I did this because of this. Right? Because I was late here, so I did that, and I turned up, and that's why I'm late. And then she's... <laughs> but, but, but if you were humble... You understand, listen, I'm sorry I'm late. And, uh, and the important thing is not to self-justify. Humility requires for you not to self-justify. But to hand, over, hand it over to God, your weaknesses and your strengths. You let God justify you. Don't justify yourself. It's in better hands when it's in God's hands. Amen. When Jesus is washing the feet of his disciples, when he says, do this as often as you gather, it's a regular check-in with God. Especially for those who are baptized, and mainly for those who are baptized, he said, Peter said, don't, don't, don't wash me, I'm, I'm all good. And Jesus says, no, you're not. And then Peter says, oh, then... If I can't be found in the kingdom, if I can't be connected to you because, um, because I don't want to do that, why don't you wash the whole lot then? And then Jesus says, you don't need the whole lot. And Jesus said, you just need to do a, an assessment and you just need to fix the small things. But again, handing it over to God and allowing him to do it. So Peter goes through this uh, process where he hands things over to God. And God says for us as well, the application here is first, service. Allowing God to service us. Probably don't understand what that means. So when you've got a car, right, you've got something wrong with your car. Who do you take it to? A mechanic. Now, if there's something wrong with the engine, do you just say, hey, can you fix, please, the, uh, the window wipers? You don't. You need to humble ourselves and we need to give the mechanic, fully surrender the car, the vehicle, to the mechanic for them to do a proper analysis. It's a regular checkup. And we need to do this regular checkup and check in with God to see if we're still in line with Him and His ways. An important thing that I grabbed from this particular passage in John 13 was that Jesus served the disciples first before we can serve other people we need to allow the master to serve us first you're probably thinking what does that mean when christ died for us he served us first and then once we accept that then we can go on and serve other people 
and we need to fully accept that. So the point of the message or the devotion is humility without justification. You have weaknesses, you have strengths, without justifying any of that stuff, you give that to God. It's in a better and better hands than your hands. And say, Lord, this is who I am. Sometimes when we justify ourselves is because we don't even like ourselves. But what God says is that, I love you the way you are. I'll change you, but I like you the way you are. And I love you and I died for that person. So when we go through foot washing, it's all about serving other people, humbling yourself before God and before the other person. It's nerve-wracking when you're... I find it more nerve-wracking to people washing my feet um, than washing other people's feet. But the person's feet you're washing, they're a traveller, a spiritual traveller. When you're washing their feet, you'll see scars and you'll see, um, you'll see cuts, maybe bruises, maybe crooked toes and all that. And there's a spiritual application there. This person has been on a journey with God. So when you are washing their feet, I want you to ask the question, how are you going spiritually on this journey? And I want you to pray over them as well individually and honor that what they say to you is just between you two just honor that so as we go um, the women will be in the hall and the men will be divided in the little kids room and also the youth room um, just follow the deacons if that's all right deacons and deaconess one over there so if you can follow the deacons uh, men and deaconess, um, that would be good. Let me pray over this part. And I want to invite you also into this prayer of emptying oneself. Asking God to, to see the things in our lives, the good things, the bad things, and say, Lord, I want to hand these things over to you. Just where you are. Let's pray. Father God, you see me and you see each person here. Lord, we're travelers and we may have picked up things on the way. And Lord, as we go and wash other people's feet, Lord, I pray that you may prepare us and wash the things that shouldn't be there in our lives, Lord, and clean us, Lord. Humble us, God. Even the scary parts in our lives, Lord, that we need courage to step into, we hand that over to you. We surrender to you. And Lord, if there's anything that needs to be surrendered, remind us that we may hand these things over to you as well. We trust you with our lives and with our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, singers. You're probably wondering... You can come up. You're probably wondering why we go through these traditions and why we do things the way we do, and it's quite convoluted. One person passes it to another person, another person passes it to another person, and so on and so forth. But what we're trying to illustrate here is servanthood. My job is to, we don't run under the hierarchy, but it's a low hierarchy. We're at the very bottom. One lecturer once said to me, if you're a pastor, you should be the biggest servant in the house. You're at the very bottom. Don't think of yourself up here, but you're at the very bottom. And so when we're doing this, my job is to serve Darcy and Josh, and then they serve the deacons, and the deacons serve you. So try not to think of it as a hierarchy, but it's an actually a low hierarchy. We're serving you. That's why we go through these 
things and do all these little bits and bobs. As um, we reflect on that Jewish tradition where Abraham and Lot followed, they invited the travelers to come and, and they washed their feet. And it was actually not the hosts who would wash the feet. Jesus was the one who set up the, and organized the, the, the Last Supper in the upper room. He organized that. He pre-organized that. But you see, which makes him the host. But then you see the host. He serves. He's breaking tradition in that sense. He's actually just going further and saying it's all about servanthood. Not only does that, he, uh, in, in the Jewish culture and tradition, you invite them and, and you invite people to eat with us. So the foot washing is all about emptying ourselves. Remember the fish tank illustration where you're emptying yourself. This part of the communion process is filling ourselves up with good stuff. Filling ourselves up with Jesus. Getting rid of self. Separating us from self. And inviting Jesus into our lives. And as Darcy and Josh illustrated, that now because we've taken this and we believe in these sacraments, we believe with all our heart, then we are new creation and we are free. We've done this and if you've done this with all your heart, then believe it. If you leave here and your time ends, the next waking thought will be Jesus. And the last thing is, is that they would invite people to stay. Now, Jesus hadn't done that yet. He did everything else in the Jewish culture. But the very last thing is for him to invite us to stay. When Jesus comes back, there will be a victory table there for us, for you and I. And he will invite us to stay in that heavenly place. And I look forward to that day. I would love for you in this moment to reflect and to think. And what I do sometimes is I close my eyes and I think about heaven. But I don't go in heaven. I think about the stairs just before the gates. And I think, and I think about that there is a man I imagine... There is a man sitting there, a humble man. And that's our Lord and Savior. And then I have a conversation with him. It takes me to different places and I have different conversations. I have different prayers. So I want to encourage you to, whatever you need to do, to imagine. I want you to think about having a conversation with Jesus. Maybe he's, he's next to you and you're praying and you're talking to God and he's next to you. So while we're singing this song, I want to encourage you to have this conversation with Jesus. This one isn't the, Lord, forgive me. Maybe it is. If, if it is, if you haven't given everything over, I want to encourage you, take that step first. But if you've already gone through the process and we've already asked for forgiveness and we believe, then I want your prayer to be more of a, thank you, Jesus. So as we sing this song, I want you to reflect on thanking God mostly our Lord and Savior, who deserves all the praise and all the glory. And I invite you to sing at the end as well.